fabulous introduction. As we say on my reserve, grazie. There you go. Yeah, I live in a little Italy part of my reserve. Yes, a lot of reserves are surprisingly cosmopolitan. A lot of people don't know that. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a delight to be here. I had a little trouble finding this place, but I managed to find it. Uh, the uh, great Aboriginal sense of direction evidently died with my, my grandparents. Um, I, I've been asked to come and I guess talk about diversity, the, the, the diverse voice in literature, in Canadian literature, which is something I've spent, oh my God, as of next year, it'll have been 30 years writing which is, I, I remember when I used to be the wunderkind. <laughs> now I'm the last man standing of that generation. First of all, let me give you a little background of who I am, where I came from. As you know, I'm from, as you heard, I'm from a place called Curve Lake, which is half an hour north of Peterborough. That's where I was born and raised, and that's where I live. Um, and my standard line is, I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion. <laughs> or as I like to say, a special occasion, if not a memorable occasion. <laughs> and growing up on my reserve, I was, um, at the same time, I came from both a big family and a small family. I came from a big family because my mother uh, was the oldest of 14. And that's what happened when you didn't have the internet. So with uh, marriages and stuff like that, I had about uh, 20 aunts and uncles, and I stopped bothering to count first cousins at about 22, 23. Now, at the same time, as I said, I came from a small family because when I was, uh, when I was born, my mother blames the fact that I was, uh, I'm an only child on the fact that I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. Breach. No cesarean. So that was enough for my mother. And I like to think my mother got both quantity and quality. <laughs> so be that as it may. Now, growing up on the reserve, um, it was kind of boring. I mean, I, re uh, I remember when I was five years old, sitting on the steps of, my, of the house I lived, and on my lap, I had a very, very big th stack of comic books. I'm one of those people that learn to read practically through comic books. But I remember sitting there thinking with these comic books on my lap when I was five years old, wow, next year I get to go to school and I'll actually be able to read these. <laughs> Which I thought was a good beginning. So as I grew up, you know, growing up on a reserve, you can only go swimming so in so many lakes, you can climb so many trees, you can only go frolicking through so many bulrushes, but life gets boring. And when I learned to read, it changed my life because I began to read about all these exotic things happening all over the world in exotic lands by exotic people that somehow managed to find their way to the lap of a little um, a mixed blood boy sitting on a reserve uh, at that time in the middle of nowhere. And I thought at that time, wouldn't it be cool if someday I could write stories about my people, my place that somehow would make it around the world and I could share those stories in a fair trade with the world, little realizing that it was going to happen. Um, so much so that next October, my 29th book comes out. Beats working for a living. So, so um, I want, when I, all this reading, opened the world for me. Each book was like a passport to new places, new, new adventures, new environments. And the more I read, the more I wanted to be a writer. The more it intrigued me, the more it excited me. Because, you know, a little, little kid on a reserve, I discovered that being a writer was like a non-sacrilegious um, non way of playing God, of being God. You got to create universes, people, places, things, environments, universes, you could make people fight, fall in love, you could ask questions, find solutions, you could do anything you wanted as a writer. And I discovered it gave me more control over the universe I created than the universe I lived in. And I found that appealing. So I decided I wanted to be a writer. But when I was growing up a thousand years ago, there were no native writers. 
Um, at that time, on my reserve, I did not know of any other Native writers. And I had no role models, and I didn't know what to do or how to go about being a writer. So in my teens, I decided, well, I'm going to do the logical thing. If I want to be a writer, if I want to do anything, I should consult those who are much wiser than me. So I decided to consult two people. I decided, the uh, first person I went to was my grade 11 English teacher. And I remember very distinctly walking in to my, my uh, homeroom class and talking and walking up to my English teacher. And I said to him, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without even looking up, my English teacher, who was right, rummaging around for something in the bottom left-hand drawer of the desk, I remember this very distinctly, without even looking up, he said, no, not really. <laughs> and that stayed with me. I mean, that reverberated around my head for a while. And I'm one of these people, I'm a firm believer that uh, the best revenge is living a good life. So as the decades went by and I became a writer and I began to pump out plays and books and things like that, and um, one of the things I get to do as a fairly successful First Nations writer is I frequently get asked to go and lecture at high schools and um, um, uh, elementary schools, etc., and talk about the writing process. So uh, oftentimes when I'm talking to these young people, to these teenagers, I say, you know, if there's one thing I want you to remember, the only thing I can really teach you, the, the most important thing you need to remember when you're walking out of this room that has come from me is never trust your grade 11 English teacher. <laughs> so, uh, the second person I went to tell was my mother. I told my mother I wanted to be a writer, and my mother looked at me with a very perplexed look saying, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. Right? And again, this is my mother. I'm a single child of a single parent. And so we were very close. So again, these words cut me to the bone. Why do you want to uh, be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. Now, I know exactly where this was coming from. My mother had a sixth grade education. Her first language was Anishinaabe. She'd spent most of her life cooking and cleaning for white people. So the idea of writing or a career as a writer was just literally not on her radar. And again, believing that revenge is, uh, living a good life is the best revenge, as the decades went by and I became a writer, using those words as my template, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. I traveled the world sending my mother postcards <laughs> from uh, India, China, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Mexico, Cuba, the Bahamas, England, Sweden, Finland, Belgium, uh, Holland, Germany, the Czech Republic, Austria, France, Spain, and Italy. And these were all postcards saying, look where writing got me. <laughs> now, so through a series of, of, of circumstances, I ended up being a writer. I, but you know, based on those first two comments, I gave up wanting to be a writer. If these people who knew more about life and, and what the world had to offer, if they knew more than me, why should I disagree? So I gave up wanting to be a writer for 10 years and it, it wasn't until my late 20s that I, I came back to the world of writing. Uh, I, and I'm one of those people that I can say, I didn't go hunting for my craft. My craft tracked me down, kicked me in the ass and said, you're a writer. And through this bizarre series of incidents, my very first legitimate writing credit, I'm about to date myself here. I was 25 or 26 when I wrote an episode of The Beachcombers. <laughs> that was my first writing credit. So, and then from there, I went to be writing for theater. And then I went to writing, um, so I went television, theater, and I started writing humorous uh, creative nonfiction articles, essays, short stories, novels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And part of the journey that I've sort of enjoyed in doing all this is the expansion, the exploration, and the celebration of the Aboriginal voice. Um, you heard some of the things I've done, artistic director of a native theater company, um, and um, so what I've, what I've tried to do in my writing is there's this perceived idea of what native literature is, and it's a very narrowly focused 
path through the larger Canadian literary community. And if you think of native literature by uh, Joseph Boyd and Richard Wagamese, et cetera, um, Lee Miracle, almost all the native literature you'll run across is either historical or deals with some form of um, guilt or dysfunction within the native community or um, and this, this is coming from my exploration of native theater, almost all the plays and novels that were coming out were either, um, were all uh, dark, bleak, sad, and angry, and, or celebrated a dysfunctional aspect of the native community. It was all negative. All the characters that were coming out of the native literary canon were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And I had a problem with that because I've been very fortunate. I've traveled to over 140 native communities across Canada and the United States. And everywhere I've been, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. And I wasn't seeing all of this. I was, um, I was seeing more or less the darker aspect of the native community. And I would look at my mother uh, at back home, and my mother was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. My mother was a very vivacious woman, great sense of humor, hardworking all of her life, but there's so much positive there. But, you know, when you, if you look at, there's an essay at the beginning of The Res Sisters by Thompson Highway, where he uses this term, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And I think that's what was happening during that first generation of Native literature the poison was being exposed. When an oppressed people get their voice back, um, chances are they're going to write about being oppressed. And I think it was, it's a cathartic thing that was happening. You know, I, I, uh, sort of a, a, a colonized hangover. Or uh, what do I, uh, a post, post-colonial stress disorder. <laughs> so all this was happening. And I sort of understood it, but then I was having a conversation with an elder on the Blood Reserve in Alberta, and we were talking about this. And he said that in his opinion for Native people, humor was the WD-40 of healing. And I thought about that. Humor is the WD-40 of healing. That is so cool, that's so smart, that's almost t-shirt worthy. <laughs> and if you put it next to the saying from Thompson Highway, um, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed, and then, you know, um, for Native people, humor is the WD-40 of healing. So I fully understood those, right? And also, I've worked with the Maori, uh, Maori playwrights in New Zealand, Aborigine playwrights in Australia, and to a lesser extent, Dalit writers in India. And we would sit and we'd talk about this, and it was pretty consensual, or a consensus was that, you know, when you've been at the bottom, of the social hierarchy, uh, be it for hundreds of years or thousands of years, and you're finally given a chance to tell your story, chances are it's not going to be a comedy. So again, that's where all that sort of, this is what is wrong with, uh, with Canada from the Aboriginal perspective came out, which is all viable and understandable. But as I said, I want to deal a little bit more with the healing aspect, the humor. So. I decided I wanted to widen that bound, that pathway of native literature of, of again, the historical, the dark, the bleak, the angry, um, the, the oppressed, all that sort of stuff, and sort of start going off on little avenues to sort of, because I'm a firm believer that all forms of art, especially literature, should reflect all the different facets of a culture. You know, not just the problems, but also the things we celebrate. So I decided I wanted to write a comedy. As I like to say, a comedy, it had absolutely, it was just a sheer celebration of the Aboriginal sense of humor with absolutely no socially redeeming qualities whatsoever. <laughs> but what people, what I didn't understand, it took me a while to understand, is the very fact that we were get, writing comedy showed, was a political statement in itself. So I wrote this one play about a 58-year-old good Christian Ojibwe woman who through a series of circumstances finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer <laughs> that she has to bootleg in order to buy an organ for the church. And it's based on a true story. 
So I, when I wrote this play, the term a native comedy was an oxymoron. Native theater and native literature, by definition, was to ask difficult questions. It was to push the envelope. It was to make the audience uncomfortable. And, but for me, I decided there are many other writers out there who are doing that much better than me. I wanted to celebrate avenues of our native culture, not just um, talk about its, the, the dysfunctional aspect, again, that narrow path. So I widened it by doing, started doing comedies, and I did a whole series of comedies. Um, my most recent being um, The Berlin Blues, which is a play about a German business conglomerate that comes to a small Ojibwe community in central Ontario wanting to build the world's largest native theme park called Ojibwe World <laughs> because it's Ojibwe-tastic with such things as bumper canoes, a 44-meter high dream catcher with interlacing laser beam webbing that keeps killing all the seagulls and the big draw is a production of Dances with Wolves, the musical. And this is based on, um, on um, at that time, about a dozen lecture tours I've done of Germany. Germans are bonkers for native culture. Even native culture and native lecturers that look more German than native. Right? And in fact, in fact, in two weeks, I'm leaving to lecture at a, a in, going to Switzerland. There's a, in Zurich, there's a museum completely geared towards the North American Aboriginal culture, or cultures, I should say. So they're bringing me over on International Museum Day. And then from there, I'm going on my 16th lecture tour of Germany. You know, that's why I've learned to say, Ich bin ein Ojibwe. <laughs> so in talking about expanding that culture, I, got, I started doing it with humor. And then I thought, well, let's go have some more fun with it. Let's play with it. Because, you know, you guys have had the written word for, I don't know, 3,000 years or longer or whatever. And we've just been telling our stories for a little over 30 years. So I thought, I want to play catch up. So I wrote a novel. My very first novel was called The Night Wanderer. And it's an Ojibwe vampire novel. And I know what you're saying. Oh, God, not another Ojibwe vampire novel. <laughs> There are so many out there. But, uh, but the reason I did this was, I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of cultural appropriation. So I decided, turnabout is fair play, so I decided I wanted to culturally appropriate a European legend and indigenize it. And at that time, I mean, for the last 10, 12, even 30, 20 years, vampires have been very popular. So I wanted to write a vampire novel. Of course, the problem being within the indigenous culture, we never had vampires. We had other monsters and demons or whatever. So the problem is how to do this. And then I remember my basic history from school that this area in north used to be at the heart of the fur trade. And it used to be quite common for French and English fur traders and ships to kidnap native people and take them back over to Europe and display them in the royal courts like zoo animals. I thought, okay, that's how I get my native character over there. And he spends... Uh, he's, he, he's over there, he gets bitten by a vampire, becomes a vampire, and spends 350 years wandering Europe, getting more and more homesick until he finally decides to come home to where his community was, which is now a contemporary First Nations community. Now, of course, you know, in writing a vampire novel, you've got this whole spectrum of characteristics you can pick up from, va from vampires. On one hand, you've got your Dracula, who is like evil, supernatural, magical, can turn into wolves, bats, mist, all these different things. And on the other hand, you have these vampires where it's basically a virus that makes you strong, live forever, and allergic to sunlight. So you have to pick your characteristics. So anyways, so I'd come up with my idea. But the big problem is, if you're going to take the, the most common characteristic, the, the um, uh, allergy to sunlight, I was like thinking, okay, how do I get a vampire from Europe to Canada? And I was thinking and thinking, I thought, well, again, going back to my childhood, you go and ask somebody who's far more wiser than you. So, I went and asked my travel agent. <laughs> Seriously. I went and talked with Joe. 
I went and sat down. I said, Joe, how do I get a vampire from Europe to Canada? And he looked at me, he burst out laughing. And I said, I'm serious. And I explained my book and he laughed some more and he said, let's find out. And he went into his magic box of every possible, you know, every, uh, every transportation device known to the universe. And he said, well, there's a flight that leaves London's Heathrow Airport at 1040 in the evening and lands in Toronto at 1.30 in the morning. So if anybody ever needs to know, that's how you get a vampire from <laughs> Europe to Canada. So that book came out. It did very, very well. In fact, it did so well that a couple of years later, my publisher said, phoned me up and said, would you be interested in turning this novel into a graphic novel? And I went, oh, cool. Uh, having grown, I talk about going full circle, having grown up reading comic books, now I get to participate in writing a comic book on steroids. <laughs> so we did, it, we did it as a graphic novel. And that, that, to me, that was so, 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 so cool, cool. My final, my, my next novel after that, wanting to play around with something else, I decided to do a little dabble in the world of, I think it's called magic realism. But where my, f the first novel had been an exploration of a uh, sort of, of um, uh, culturally appropriating European legend, I decided to take a traditional Aboriginal legend and contemporize it. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the trickster I decided to take the Anishinaabe trickster, Nana Bush, Nana Buju, and um, put him in the world today where he's coming back to a reserve he hasn't been to in like 60, 70 years. He's been, he, he's just dried out. And he shows up with long blonde hair and blue eyes, looking like a white guy so no one would recognize him, riding a vintage 1953 Indian chief motorcycle, <laughs> simply for the irony. And that, I'm proud to say that was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award. So again, I wanted to play with the definition of what is native literature. I got tired of, as somebody once said, I, I remember talking with these two women, they were coming out of two different plays and two different cities. I said, what did you think to both of them? And I got the same answer. They said, I don't think I'm going to read any more native play, uh, see any more native plays, I'm tired of being depressed. And I was feeling that from plays and a lot of our novels. So I wanted to do something that sort of, you know, showed that we're, we're not all doom and gloom. Um, so, so, and um, Motorcycle and Sweetgrass is very, very funny. So where to go from all that? And as I said, I've got, a, I've, I've written a whole bunch of different genres, but more recently, last year, primarily, not on a whim, but just, I have been trying for years to put together a project and I was not having any luck. I wanted to put a, together an anthology by all of, of short stories by as many of, the, of Canada and uh, Canadian native writers of Aboriginal science fiction. And I was having a lot of problems with it because uh, publishers were saying there's no such thing. You know, it's hard to sell something that doesn't exist. And I went, okay. And not only that, I wanted, being a writer myself, I wanted to pay all my writers like $500 for their short story, which immediately put any book, like, you know, if, uh, if I got 10 writers, $5,000 in debt to begin with. So I couldn't get it done. And I remember last year just sitting around thinking, I had the proverbial light bulb go over my head and I went, why not just do it myself? Just write them. You know, so... I, uh, last fall, I sat down and in a two-month period wrote six short stories, native science fiction, of which the title story and the title of the, the collection is called Take Me to Your Chief. <laughs> and in between, I've written three other short stories to sort of fill it out. And again, wanting to expand that pathway that is native literature, native science fiction. I've had so much fun doing it. It's been, you know, having grown up watching Star Trek and all that and to be able to sit down and take these basic characteristics of science fiction and filter them through an Aboriginal consciousness. Um, it was just, what, hey, what can I say? It beats, as I said earlier, it beats working for a living. Now, one of the so in terms of expanding the boundary, so I've been, as I said, vampires, um, magic realism, science fiction, you know, I'm who knows, I may even do, I actually, I, I dabbled in the world of, of native erotica. No, I did not do Fifty Shades of Red. 
one of the things I've, uh, one of the uh, a tr a trilogy of books I've done where I actually have gotten together a series of essays by various writers on various aspects of Native culture. The first one was a, an exploration and deconstruction of Aboriginal humor called Me Funny. The second one was an uh, exploration and deconstruction of Aboriginal sexuality called Me Sexy. And the third one, which just came out about six or eight months ago, was an exploration and deconstruction of the Aboriginal artistic spirit. What you know, what, uh, what in our culture makes us do what we do and how do we use our culture in our art form? And that one was called Me Artsy. <laughs> so uh, so the, I basically dedicated a, a good chunk of my life to expanding the perception of native literature, right? And um, I have no idea where I'm going to go next. <laughs> It's like, I don't know, it's like, well, let's wait and see. I, I co-created and, and uh, was the head writer of a native sitcom on APTN. Um, and so I'm always interested in what is new, what hasn't been done, what can I put some Aboriginal DNA on, right? So I'm doing native science fiction. Oh, I should mention this. Um, as you know, next year is 150th anniversary of uh, Confederation, and I've been commissioned by the National Arts Center in Ottawa to write a play about John A. MacDonald. <laughs> now, oh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> now, first of all, I don't normally do um, historical plays. I don't normally do plays about dead white people. <laughs> but they're offering me a lot of money and the NAC, and they said, do it however you want to do it. <laughs> so, I, I, and I tell all my native friends this, and they're, they're just saying, you know, eviscerate him, eviscerate him. And, but I'm thinking, I wonder if the NAC is trying to spend all that money for a hatchet job. So I've, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to serve two masters. But the proof will come out in the pudding once, once I get down and start actually working on it and writing it. But I'm so looking forward to this. I'm going to have so much fun with it. Um, so, uh, as I said, that's my little, what I'm trying to do in the concept of diversity and, and broadening and expanding and celebrating the Aboriginal voice out there. Uh, I, I know I'm repeating myself and talking about how I'm, uh, I'm trying to convince the world that we do more than just dark and depressing theater and, and novels. You know, um, Joseph Boyden is a very good friend of mine, but I still haven't worked up the nerve to read the Orinda. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, before I go, as I said, I, I, I wrote a book on Native humor, and one of the interesting things I did was, I didn't want it to be just a book about Native humor, I wanted it to be a book of Native humor. It's a collection of essays from various contributors on different aspects of native humor. Thompson Highway has a, an essay in it on why Cree is the funniest language ever created. And I've got an essay by a, stand -up, a native stand-up comedian and by um, um, uh, oral, uh, the humor in oral storytelling, all the, uh, the, the humor in visual um, art, all these different things. But I also wanted to, wanted to include examples of native humor. So I spent a year collecting Indian jokes, as it's called, from all over North America. And what you're going to find interesting, um, what I found interesting is oftentimes, I mean, I've, I've done, I have an entire hour and a half lecture on native humor specifically, so I'm, I'm just going to give you two minutes of it, where um, the interesting about native humor is the jokes, oftentimes they're, they're some of the jokes are, you can tell, very specifically written by Native people for Native people to be appreciated by Native people. And other jokes are, insert own ethnic here, right? I'll give you an example of an Indian joke. Now, by Native people for Native people. Why do Native people hate snow? Because it's white and all over our land. I'll give you an example of insert own ethnic background here, a type of Indian joke. And just to let you know, you're all adults here, but there, there's a nasty word in it. So, what do you call an Indian with a PhD? A doctor, you fucking racist. 
right? And I say, insert own ethnic here because I've heard variations of that joke. What do you call a black man who flies a plane? A pilot, you fucking racist. Anyways, so I'm going to leave you with my favorite joke. This was told to me by a native woman on, uh, in Nanaimo, and I just about fell out of the car when she told me this. So I leave you with this joke. These two native women are getting to know each other. And one woman is absolutely shocked and surprised to discover that the other woman has 10 children that she's all named Lloyd. And the other woman can't understand this. She says, why did you name all your kids Lloyd? Don't you find that confusing? And the mother goes, oh no, not at all. In fact, if anything, it's a great time saver. First thing in the morning, all you have to do is yell, Lloyd, time to get up. Lloyd, breakfast is ready. Lloyd, time for school. They all hear and they all know what they have to do. But the other woman isn't convinced. She says, but what do you do if you have to talk to just one of your kids, like the second youngest or the oldest? What do you do then? And the mother goes, oh, well, if I have to talk to just one of my kids specifically, I call them by their last name. And on that note, I was told I had 20 minutes. I hope I've given you uh, 20 minutes to, mem to worth remembering. Thank you. Miigwech.